So my, I don't think I told you my name. If you're, well, if you're here, you know who I am. My name is Rich Freeland. I'm the pastor here. Um, this mic always, I want to always touch it and move it and I don't even need it. Um, sorry. I've had a tough few days, I guess. 
Um, so if I'm off this morning, I'm going to blame it on the travel. Um, I was in New Jersey to be with my mom and my sister. Uh, my mom just sold her house, and we were um, going through things to see what to keep and what not to keep. Um, it's a really strange thing to pick through your parents' life you know, uh, to decide what's worth keeping and what's not worth keeping. Um, you know, the joy of it was that there were a lot of memories, um, a lot of old pictures and slides and, and things like that. And, um, you know, and then finding things like the strangest things brought home, you know, brought back memories. You know, there was an old can opener that I remember as a kid opening those cans of Coke, you know. Um, and I was like, we have to have that. Um, and so, you know, it was, um, it was a tough week for my mom. And, um, you know, I think it's been, been tough for all of us. And so, uh, but I am glad to be back. I think the one thing I did discover is that Winterville is my home. Um, I um, was anxious to get back here. Rebecca was anxious to get back too. And, and certainly being out of the church for a few days just felt... Um, didn't feel right, and so uh, so I'm glad to be back with you. Uh, this morning we share some joys. Um, certainly, last week was a joyful week. We had two baptisms, Colton and Rebecca, and, and that was uh, uh, certainly a wonderful day. Um, again, we are seeing more people here, and so that is certainly something to be joyful about. And I'll just add that, you know, time with family is something to be grateful for and to be joyful about. Um, the memories, you know, that we keep. Um, I think that um, we learned this week that it's not the stuff. Nobody wants the stuff, you know, and when you leave, you can't take it with you. But the memories, the memories are what are important. And so um, I share that joy with you. I'm certainly grateful for the memories. Um, birthdays and anniversaries, I'm sorry, I don't have the list with me. Oh, I didn't have the list. I'm going to move, Abby, is that okay? You don't have to follow me. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so May 1st, uh, Luke Hollowell had a birthday. Um, and then I guess this week, May 6th, um, Kelsey Moore has a birthday. Uh, and those are our birthdays for the week. I don't see any anniversaries. Now our concerns, um, we continue to pray for those affected by COVID-19. Uh, we pray that as many people as possible will get vaccinated so we can uh, return to some sense of, of normalcy. We pray for all those who are currently suffering with COVID-19. Continue to pray for uh, my friend Ken Youngs. We pray for Vidalia King and Janice Yanda. God, who raised up and exalted Jesus in your steadfast love, help us bring consolation to those known to us, those whom we name on our lips and in the silence of our hearts. Return to our memory those whom we have forgotten. Be present to those who have no one and to each of us in our doubting. In Jesus' name we pray. In your order of service this morning, there is a call to worship. And if you will join me in that. Provocative and surprising is the God of resurrection. How wonderful are the strange ways of God. Making holy our sorrow. God of earth's life from death. Disavowing power that threatens and destroys. God is the force of justice. The peculiar practices of God unsettle and confuse. Whatever shame follows away, it is welcome in this place. Creative one, come and open our hearts, our minds, and our shared sense of possibility. Help us to perceive the multitude of opportunities to live out your desires for us. As a community, fill us with passion for discerning your will and living it out with courage. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
we have singing today, um, which is a blessing, um, and um, you all are singing, and I just want to remind you that um, please keep your mask on while you sing, um, try not to be too loud, and try not to project too much, um, but I think, um, I am certainly happy that we do have um, singing, and we'll be having your turn. Uh, Ruth is happy as well, and thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Julia, and, and, and thank you, Mitzi. We appreciate it. So before we read our scripture this morning, I just ask you to take a moment to get quiet and to settle into this space, a moment to breathe as a community. sound of your breath is the sound of the divine. And this is a holy space. Holy God, word made flesh, let us come to this word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations, clear the cobwebs from our ears, penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can, we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. Amen. This morning, um, our scripture is from Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Um, I will tell you that that is not where I began this week. Um, I began with John and had fully intended to preach about the vine and... Um, I just couldn't get anything. And so, um, so I turned to Acts. And so uh, we read from the New Revised Standard Version, again, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now, there was an Ethiopian eunuch a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip, and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our scripture response this morning is Ubi Caritas. I don't know if my Latin is any good, but. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know too much about Unix. Um, my, my experience or my knowledge of Unix is limited to Game of Thrones, you know, Grey Worm or, or, or Varus, one of the Unsullied. That's about as much as I know about Unix. But I don't know, I guess I know enough to know that they are probably not the best representation of this Unix. But I'm going to back up just a little bit and give you some context for what, we're, what we've read. The word Ethiopia comes from the Greco-Roman Empire. Its origins indicate it may have come from a Greek phrase meaning burnt face. Now this phrase is by no means intended as derogatory. The term Ethiops carried no social implications. In fact, Africans assimilated in just a few generations into the Greco-Roman cultures. They held jobs and had businesses, just as other citizens did. Slavery wasn't race-based. In fact, most slaves were European or Mediterranean in origin. So the presence of this Ethiopian on this wilderness road leaving Jerusalem was perhaps uncommon, but it was not an occasion for Philip to feel afraid or threatened. The fact that this man was from a different country, had a different skin color, did not cause Philip any concern. He didn't feel the need to clutch his purse, move, move to the other side of the road, Philip didn't yell for the Ethiopian to go back to where he came from. No, nope, Philip did none of these things. Rather, he was led by the Spirit to chase after the Ethiopian eunuch. This man was different. Different in so many ways, but he was a follower of the God of Israel. He was a child of God. They had more in common than not. So Philip chases after the chariot to speak to the Ethiopian. Excuse me. <coughs> that may have been the wrong thing to do. <coughs> Sorry. Now, the term Ethiopia was also meant to indicate a place at the end of the earth, a place that was beyond any man's reach. <clears throat> Herodotus used the term to explain a place that was uninhabitable by man. <clears throat> Excuse me. And given what we know of this time and place in history, it is more than likely that this eunuch was from Cush. Now, the kingdom of Cush was an ancient kingdom in Nubia. It was located at the Sudanese and southern Egyptian Nile Valley. And this would have been just north of what is today called Ethiopia. So the man's place of origin is significant because Philip's encounter ultimately brings the gospel to another part of the world, to people not of Israel. And just as sort of a side note here, it's really a significant meeting because it's significant to the future of the church. When Philip meets that Ethiopian, he is fulfilling the request of Jesus from earlier in Acts. In Acts 1, verse 8, we read, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Ethiopia was the end of the earth. Now the text, the text goes on to say that the eunuch was a court eunuch. Now court eunuchs develop out of the structure of the harem, where the eunuch is trusted to protect the women and their sons, sons who may someday grow up to be rulers. Eunuchs were given positions of trust 
because they were considered to be loyal and they weren't considered to be threats. You see, the court eunuch could not build his own dynasty. He could not procreate. Having been taken from their natal family, unable to create a family, the eunuch became dependent upon the ruler that they served. But the eunuch was also loyal to the rulers they served because of the people's general dislike of them. They were different. Schoenberg, in a, in a book called Bible Trouble, Queer Reading at the Boundaries of Biblical Scholarship, writes this. He says, eunuchs can be read as figures with the potential to queer constructions of what was one of the most important identity category, categories of antiquity, masculinity. So eunuchs, they fall into a category of masculinity in the ancient Greek Roman society that one researcher called unman. This was the idea that a man had to embody the positive terms in a series of binary oppositions. For example, free or enslaved, native or foreign, hard or soft, active, passive, dominant or submissive, and you get the idea. And along with these, there were also the binaries of sexuality, which is what we think of most, I think, when we think of a eunuch. So if a man possessed what was considered to be a negative trait, if he was considered to be passive or soft, then his masculinity would be called into question. It would have been possible that a eunuch possessed some of these so-called positives, but more than likely not all. Now, there's so much here to talk about in terms of sexuality and gender and, and sexual identity, but I, I don't want to go there today. It is safe for us, I think, to assume that a eunuch's masculinity would surely be called into question. So now as we go back to the story on the road in the chariot reading Isaiah, and the eunuch is reading out loud, and this was customary at the time. He was reading from scripture, and we can surmise that from the original text that he was returning from a trip to Jerusalem where he presumably went to worship. It would seem that he considered himself to be of the Jewish faith. And in fact, today there are um, communities of Ethiopian Jews who live in Israel. And yet, he would have been an outcast in that faith. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. And this is why the eunuch is an outcast. And I forgive, please forgive me for the language, but it's in the text, and so I'm, I'm going to go with it. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1 says, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose, or whose penis is cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. So the eunuch would not have been accepted, would not have been considered a member of the tribe of Israel or a member of the faith. So I'm going to just stop a moment. My mouth is a little dry and there's a lot there. So to summarize, Philip sees a black man who turns out to be a court eunuch from Ethiopia, who considers himself to be Jewish. Now the spirit places Philip in the Ethiopian's path and then nudges Philip to run after the chariot to speak with the Ethiopian. There's something familiar about this. If we think about Jesus, how many times did Jesus find himself with someone different? 
someone unclean or unworthy, someone cast out or looked down upon, someone who others thought should be excluded. I mean, we see it repeatedly. Jesus stands with the women, the children, the poor, the sick, the tax collector, the zealot, terrorists, the prostitute, the centurion. There are many examples. And here we have Philip in a similar situation. Philip finds himself on the road with a man of foreign origin, a man who at that time many would have considered less than a man because of his sexual identity, because he was a eunuch. But Philip doesn't run the other way. He doesn't say, go back to where you came from. He doesn't say, you're not a real Jew. He doesn't insult his masculinity. He runs after him. He runs after him to share the good news of Jesus. The Ethiopian man had been reading from Isaiah, and he's reading this passage that many thought was speaking directly about Jesus. But he wants to know who the scripture is talking about. And Philip is there on that road to tell him. Philip is there to share the good news that Jesus lived and died for. Having heard that word, the Ethiopian is so moved that he asks to be baptized. Here, Philip has another opportunity to exclude the man. He could have said, you're not Jewish. I can't do this. I'm sorry, but because you're an eunuch, you'll never know the glory of God. Just go back to Ethiopia. But Philip doesn't say any of those things. Instead, Philip takes him into the water and baptizes him. Philip welcomes the Ethiopian man into the fellowship of believers. He welcomes the man into the kingdom. Here on this wilderness road, on the route from Jerusalem to Africa, Philip demonstrates that the gospel is for everyone. The love of Jesus is for everyone. There are no requirements. No questions to be answered, no prayers to be recited. You don't have to be from a particular place or have a certain heritage. God's love is for all, and all people are deserving. See, Philip goes out of his way to meet this person. He goes out of his way to welcome a person who many would have considered an unman, less than a man. He goes out of his way to teach this person who was considered to be a slave in spite of his standing in the court. He goes out of his way to welcome into the body of Christ a person who was different in so many ways. This person whose sexual identity was unclear, whose social status was unclear, whose race and skin color were different. Philip embraced and welcomed into the body of Christ this person who blurred the lines of many of the things Philip understood to be normal, things that he understood to be right and acceptable. It poses the question, what would Christian pastors or congregations today do with this eunuch? Would the eunuch be welcomed? Would the eunuch be loved? Would he be baptized? I don't really want to answer that question. I suspect not. How many have been turned away from the love of Christ because they are different? Or feared? Feared because of what they might do? Feared because they're different? You know, it reminds me of an experience I had in my previous church. We regularly had homeless people in our congregation. And I know that most churches, well, I shouldn't say most, I know a lot of churches would not be comfortable with letting a dozen homeless people into their congregation to have coffee and to have pastries with them, to talk to them. 
That's what we're supposed to do. You know, you've probably seen the story on the internet about the, the new pastor at the church who dressed up like a homeless man and was standing out for the church and everyone ignored him. No one did anything for him. And then he came up and preached and introduced himself as their new pastor. That's what we've, many of us have come to do, right? We've come to ignore those things that make us uncomfortable, to ignore the people that are different. We turn them away because their language is different, or they love differently, or their identity expression is different. And how many stay away because they've been told that God doesn't love them? I mean, where? Where is the love of Jesus? Where is the love of Philip? Jesus turned no one away when feeding the 5,000 throughout the New Testament. We never hear Jesus say, they can't follow me. In fact, Jesus commands his apostles to take the good news to the ends of the earth, to everyone. The Jesus that we love and follow accepted everyone for who they are. Philip accepted the eunuch as he was. Here at Winterville Christian Church, we accept everyone as they are. Here, you come as your authentic self, and you're loved. Today, in this world that we live in, when we talk about race or sexuality, violence, and even our health, it's all politicized. But this isn't about politics. It's about the love of Christ for all of us. It's about a person's God-given God right to be who they are. Their right to live in God's world with all of God's creatures. To live without the fear of becoming the target of hatred and violence. Because someone doesn't like the color of their skin or doesn't approve of who they love or where they grew up or if they are poor or sick or addicted. It's about human rights. It's about love. You know, there are so many reasons why people exclude and hate. And yet they overlook the one reason why they should love. Jesus. They overlook the perfect expression of humanity found in Jesus. The example of who we are to strive to be like. Remember early on, I think I told you that the answer to every question is Jesus. So Philip on that wilderness road from Jerusalem saw Jesus in that Ethiopian man. He only saw Jesus. He didn't see race. He didn't see color, sexuality, religion. He saw a human being. He saw a reflection of Jesus, a person created in the image of God. And Philip went out of his way to bring the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. See, Philip saw a person deserving of the love of Jesus, deserving of God's love. And what did he do? He ran after him. The gospel tells us that we are to welcome the stranger, the little child, care for the widows and off, off orphans, to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and give shelter, shelter to the homeless. We should love my neighbor as myself. And then, and then, I have to tell of this good news to the end of the earth and to share God's love with everyone. As Christians, sometimes understanding and following the will of God can be challenging. However, sometimes it's easier to discern what God's will is not. And I'm certain that God's will does not include hating Asian Americans, for example. I'm certain that God's will does not support racism of any kind. They're all God's creatures. I'm certain that God does not hate God's creation. In fact, God believes that creation in all its creatures, God believes it to be good. I'm certain that God does not consider anyone to be three-fifths of a person. 
or to be any less worthy of God's love or our love. See, Philip had the opportunity on that road to do something else. He could have ignored the angel of the Lord. He could have said no to the spirit. He could have ignored the man. He could have stayed silent, went on his way, but he didn't. He was led by the spirit to share God's love and to share the good news of Jesus. I stand here today and I feel that nudge of the spirit. I feel the presence of the spirit urging me on to say something, to do something. I know that the Spirit is nudging me, and, and I'm sure the Spirit nudges you, if not all the time, every once in a while. And right now, the Spirit is here with us. She's with us always, and we can't ignore her. So if we listen, if we pay attention to the Spirit, I believe that we will hear tell us, we will hear her tell us to speak up, not to shout down, shout, shout them down and tell them all the reasons they are wrong and we are right. That's not the way of Jesus. I believe that she's tapping us on the shoulder, whispering in our ears, guiding us toward that wilderness, wilderness road to share the love of God, to share the good news of Jesus with someone, anyone, everyone. There is someone who is just waiting to hear it. Someone who is ready to change. Someone who's ready to come back. There's someone out there who needs to be shown the love of God. You know, that the, the Holy Spirit didn't tell Philip to go change that Ethiopian man. The Holy Spirit put Philip in a position to share the love of Christ. The Holy Spirit put Philip on that road to be of service to that Ethiopian man. She put Philip there to share the good news. So I encourage you to listen for the Spirit. Be aware of God's presence in your life. Because she may just be putting you on the wilderness road with an Ethiopian eunuch. She may be giving you the opportunity to change someone's life with the gospel. I feel as though silence is no longer an option. The world is in need of God's love. The world is in need of the gospel. The gospel that tells us in so many different ways that God loves us. God loves all of us. God doesn't have favorite races or countries or sports teams. There are no favorites in God's kingdom. We are all worthy. We are all deserving. And we are all loved. It may be idealistic to think that love will change this world. But 2,000 years ago, a man walked this earth, a man who loved unconditionally, a man who called out injustice and countered it with love and mercy, and that man changed this world. Had he not, we would have forgotten the name Jesus a long time ago. There's, uh, there's so much running through my mind. Because we see it continually. We see the hatred and we see the violence. We see people who claim Jesus stand against human rights. Stand against civil rights. We watched a movie yesterday. I'm way off topic here, but we watched The Sound of Metal. And if you can get past the first few minutes of heavy metal music, it is an amazing movie. And we were we was commenting about that the man in the film 
looked into getting an operation and he had no insurance and the operation was $40,000. And you know, and Rebecca said to me, she said, you know, it's rich, you know, healthcare is for the rich. That just doesn't seem right. You know, legal defense is for the rich. So much of our society is geared towards those who have wealth and privilege and the rest, well, too bad. That's just, you know, you're poor, you'll always be poor. You know, you're inferior, you'll always be inferior. But I don't see how anyone can believe that having read the Gospels, having just a little bit of knowledge of Jesus. I'm going to stop there. So I think that each of us is called to that wilderness road in some way or another. Each of us is asked to chase after the chariot and to share God's love to the ends of the earth. So go out and share God's love. I think that's pretty easy. Maybe so. Now as we move to communion, we look at this table and we say that this table is for everyone. All are welcome. We know that all are welcome doesn't necessarily mean all are welcome. We know that in some places, we know that in some places people, you know, some people are more welcome than others. But at this table, we welcome everyone. In this congregation, we welcome everyone. If you don't have a communion cup, Julia has some, she's giving those out. I remind you too that this is also the time at which we take up our offering. And we have left plates uh, at, the, uh, at the two entrances. Um, you can give online. And I ask that you continue to be as generous as you have been. We are very fortunate. Um, this congregation is, is generous and giving and willing to serve. And so um, I thank you for that. Um, if you would just pray with me before we do the communion. What is to prevent us from living what we believe? There is no power greater than God's, no force more enduring than love. We have been given all we need to build the kingdom among us. With resurrection hope, let us bring what we have together and make it so. Spirit of joy, we bring these gifts with gratitude for your sustenance, no matter the barriers. Keep us steady in the promises we make to our neighbors through proclamations of love and symbols of solidarity. With our time, our material resources, our hearts, and our imaginations. This morning our communion hymn is One Bread, One Body.
in prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As uh, Missy was playing One Bread, One Body, I was thinking that, and I'm sorry, I know I've gone long, but I have to have a lot of my mind there for today. Um, I was thinking that the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, is an amazing denomination. Um, we were founded by free thinkers. Um, one of the things that I've related to with Barton Stone is his questioning of things, his questioning of the Trinity or other things. And, um, and I think that's so wonderful and healthy for, for faith and for uh, community. But there's one thing that troubles me, I guess, about the disciples of Christ. Here we say all are welcome. And that means that no matter who you are, you can come to this table, you can come in this building, you can serve, you can lead, you can chair the board, you can do anything that your heart desires and that we need. You are free and welcome and affirmed and you can do it, right? We do not deny anyone the ability to serve. But there are churches within the disciples who do. There are churches in the disciples who are much more conservative than we are, who are not open and affirmed. There are churches, you know, around us that say all are welcome, but they're not. Not everyone is welcome. And so when we say that you are welcome at this table, we mean you are welcome at this table. You do not have to believe what I believe. You do not have to believe what anyone else in this room believes. You, you may not believe anything. You don't have to worry about the things you've done, the people you've hurt, the things you've said. None of that matters because at this table, there is grace and there is forgiveness and there is love. And so when we say all are welcome, all are welcome. And in this meal, we remember, we remember the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus. The one who still takes on flesh among us today. And on the night that he would be arrested, he gathered with his friends, his companions, and they gathered at a table. And I'm sure they talked about the things that had been happening and the things that they had experienced. And at that table was one who would betray him. At that table were zealots, terrorists tax collectors. There were all kinds of people at that table with him. And it was a tense and it was a dangerous time. And yet they connected over the love of God and the love of Jesus. And as they did so, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke the bread and shared it with his disciples saying, take and eat this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he also took the cup and he gave thanks. And he shared it with his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, the cup of the new covenant, the cup of my love poured out for you. And do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, through this broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. And through this cup, we participate in the new life that Christ gives.
communion song is when you believe. my nearly, I don't know, photorealistic uh, representation of <laughs> Philip and the eunuch on, <laughs> oh, goodness. I think it's the teacher in me that gets, you know, kind of taken away by these things, like, you know, I need to create something, um, who knows what next week will bring, <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Uh, so let's see, we have some opportunity. Oh, we're going to pass the piece first, I think. Let's do that. I'm sorry. I, I, I told you, it's been a tough week, and I may be a little tired. Um, we have read recently, uh, when Jesus appeared to the apostle, he said, peace be with you. And as I've said many times, the early Christians greeted each other with the kiss of peace. And so while I don't recommend you do that, unless you know the person really well, um, it's that time that we offer the peace of Christ to each other. And so may the peace of Christ be with you all. We do have um, some opportunities to talk about. Um, there is a, a concert outside today at the Memorial Baptist Church at 4 p.m. Please bring a lawn chair if you intend to go. And if you can, bring a teddy bear that will be given to the Teddy Bear Advocacy Center. I don't know what that is, but um, does anybody know what that is? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yes, Connie. Kind of. Yeah, it's part of what's called the uh, CAC. It, it helps children who have been sexually abused. Wow. Very good. So I don't know if you heard that, but it's an organization that helps children who have been abused. And so there will be children singing with the adult choir. Um, I've put a bunch of information in your uh, order of service about the event. Um, I do too want to um, share with you that on June, oh gosh, no. 13th. I, June 13th, I went ahead of my head for a second. On June 13th, um, I will be getting ordained and installed um, right here, live and in person. And so of course, you, uh, we're gonna do it during the regular service um, with a little reception after, and so please, um, I hope that you can all make it. Um, and that's June 13th. Uh, I also started to, um, I started to design a t-shirt. I feel like we need shirts. We're a team. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, hopefully in the next week or two, um, I'll send out something uh, with, um, you know, with a way for you to get uh, a Wonderful Christian Church t-shirt. Um, it's a good way to let people know who we are. <laughs> and start a conversation. And uh, I think that's all of our opportunities. Did I miss anything? You really good, Connie? Did you mention the blood drive? Oh, I did not. May 18th. 19th. 19th. <laughs> May 19th from 3, three to, to seven. 7. Here in Fellowship Hall, we are having a blood drive uh, for the Red Cross. And so please... If you can come. Yes, Ken. Do you know if the county is doing a Bible school, summer Bible school for the kids? I have not heard anything yet. Okay. I will keep you posted. Yes, ma'am. Camp Caroline, camp reservations. Ah, that's right. I hope all of them can go. <laughs> yep, Camp Caroline, yes, uh, for sure they are. They are doing camp this year. All right. So today our closing hymn begins with friends we have in Jesus.
I'm sorry that we've gone long today. Um, when I read from Deuteronomy, you should have figured that anything could happen. <laughs> so um, I apologize for that. I, I you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel a lot, you know. I'm one of those people who feel a lot. And, but I don't let it out. Like, we'll watch the news and Rebecca will cry, um, but I just kind of internalize it, you know. And so um, I come up to you here today, and it's like, oh, i got to say these things, you know. And so, um, you know, so I, I apologize for keeping it. So if you will, pray with me as I offer this benediction. When everything good begins to feel out of reach, when collective change seems impossible, or hope is simply hard to find, Christ whispers peace, peace among us. Not to dull our need to feel sorrow or to quell necessary conflict, but to remind us again of what's so easily forgotten. Evil has not overtaken us. Love is still alive. God is potential, always with us, with this peace that sustains Go with confidence, go with love, and in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday and a good week. Mm -hmm.